welcome. Welcome to Tier Talks. And this is the first Tier Talks in Westchester. So uh, we appreciate the opportunity to bring you a dynamic discussion. Um, glad everybody has taken the time out to attend. And we hope everyone leaves with uh, one more thing that they knew today that they didn't know yesterday. And that's, uh, for me, the mark of a good day. So Tier Talks is presented by MT Bank. Uh, MT believes in a lot of things that the university does. Proud sponsor, and MT is starting to have a bigger presence here in the downstate area. So, uh, support our sponsor. Go, uh, go, go open a bank account, if you will, MT Bank. So, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Neil Calvin, class of '81. A little bit about Neil. He's the managing member of Calvin and Associates LLC, Corporate and Securities Council to the legal cannabis industry. Uh, so, Neil combines 33 years of practicing corporate and securities law at the highest levels with extensive cannabis industry experience, and he'll speak to that. And his topic for this evening is current cannabis investment and legal challenges, and I hand it off to Neil. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Good evening, and welcome. Thank you to the Binghamton University Alumni Association for inviting me here tonight. My name is Neil Kaufman, SUNY Binghamton class of 1981. That's a long time ago. It is only fitting that I share with, uh, with you tonight what I have learned about cannabis uh, with fellow alumni of Binghamton, the very place I have to thank for so much of my formative cannabis experience. <laughs> you may notice that I will throughout my talk tonight mostly use the term cannabis, not marijuana, pot, weed, grass, reaper, or other slang terminology. That is a very strong preference in the industry. Uh, it refers to the smokable, or now processable, flower that we popularly call marijuana, as well as to its close genetic cousin, hemp. Uh, as the cannabis industry is professionalizing, and did I really just refer to a cannabis industry? Um, we much prefer using the proper terminology, and you will soon understand why. For over 10,000 years, ancient cultures in China, India, Persia, and elsewhere have used cannabis for a variety of medical and industrial purposes. Numerous ancient texts refer to cannabis, inclu including uses for rheumatism, menstrual problems, inflammation, cataracts, glaucoma, cancer, leprosy, for a variety of other reasons. In the Book of Exodus, cannabis, referred to as cannabosum, was purportedly one of the ingredients contained in the holy anointing oil passed from the God of the Bible to Moses. So these contentions that cannabis has no medical use as you can see, are pretty well unfounded. The Venetian Republic, the first European empire to emerge from the Dark Ages, industrialized around processing hemp into rope, sails, and fine linen-like cloth. Britain became the industrial Goliath of Western Europe in large part due to its exploitation of hemp for its merchant and naval fleets. British kings mandated hemp cultivation by domestic farmers, immigrants, and early American colonists. While the father of our country, George Washington, was trying to breed high THC hemp at Mount Vernon, Martha made the first American flag from hemp cloth. Thomas Jefferson also grew hemp and smoked it for his migraines. James Madison is reported to have stated that sweet hemp, get the euphemism there, gave him the insight to create a new and democratic nation, the father of our Constitution. Beginning in the 1830s, cannabis-based products like Squire's extract and Tilden's extract became popular medications in this country. By 1850, the United States Pharmacopoeia listed cannabis as a treatment for many conditions, including convulsions. Also by about 1850, hemp had dropped from being the most popular crop in America to third most commonly grown, behind only slave economy driven cotton and tobacco. By the latter half of the 19th century, every pharmaceutical company in America was busy manufacturing cannabis-based patented cures, including E.R. Squibb, Park Davis, and Eli Lilly. There's a widely circulated quote from Abraham Lincoln to the effect that two of my favorite things are sitting on my front porch smoking a pipe of sweet hemp and playing my Hona harmonica. Now there is a, admittedly a scholarly debate over whether he ever actually said or wrote that, but that's just too great a quote to ignore. <laughs> America's cannabis fad lasted from the mid-1800s into the 20th century. Alas, like all good things, such as our college years in Binghamton, you knew this had to end. By the 1930s, 
several anti-cannabis dynamics were dangerously at play. Harry Anslinger is the man most responsible for the American anti-cannabis laws. He was an anti-corruption bureaucrat who actually started out pro-cannabis. However, as prohibition ended in 1933, he realized that heroin and cocaine were not enough to support his department. He was the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, the predecessor of the FBI. So he began to aggressively advocate a nationwide ban on the evil weed. He authored sensationalist articles, eagerly published by the 28 newspapers owned by William Randolph Hearst, whose vertically integrated business empire had substantial timber interests that could be harmed by hemp. Hearst had his newspapers drop the term cannabis and use only marijuana in order to associate cannabis with unpopular Mexican immigrants. There were also rumors that the DuPont chemical family, whose company invented nylon around this time, sought to undermine hemp competition by supporting this anti-cannabis wave. Anslinger especially liked to cite the story of Victor Lakata, who supposedly massacred his entire family because he was a marijuana smoker. As it turned out, Lakata had a serious mental illness and did not use cannabis. But those kind of details never stopped Anslinger. When 29 out of 30 pharmacists and drug reps objected to his proposals to ban cannabis, he discarded the 29 objectors and repeatedly cited the single biased dissenter. Now why would an otherwise upstanding civil servant act like this? Well, this is quite clearly explained in Anslinger's own words. Reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. The satanic music, jazz, and swing of Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers result from marijuana usage. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and any others. Those are his words, not mine for the record. Now, most of us have heard about the anti cannabis propaganda film, Reefer Madness. And if you bear with me for a moment here, I will figure out how to navigate to the video. This is the trailer from the film. In this film, you will see the ease with which this vicious plant can be grown in your neighbor's yard, rolled into harmless looking cigarettes hidden in an innocent shoe or watch case. If you want a good smoke, try one of these. You will meet Bill, who once took pride in his strong will as he takes the first step toward enslavement. Of course, if you're afraid. destroying reefer they find a moment's pleasure but at a terrible price debauchery violence murder suicide and the ultimate end of the marijuana addict hopeless insanity the result of this hysteria was the marijuana tax act of 1937 the MTA imposed licensing, registration, and stamp tax requirements that effectively made cannabis illegal. Anslinger drafted it in secret. Few congressional hearings were held, and many congressmen knew little about it, nor had they read the bill. Do any of these tactics sound familiar nowadays? The AMA, the New York Academy of Medicine, and most doctors opposed the MTA, but nothing could stop Anslinger and his merry band of fools. He continued his anti-cannabis campaign through the 1950s, encouraging Congress to impose ever stricter sentences on marijuana. Finally, in 1969, the U.S. Supreme Court in Leary versus the United States, yes, that Timothy Leary, struck down the MTA, but the reprieve did not last long. In 1970, the Nixon administration passed the Controlled Substances Act, which defined marijuana very broadly and placed it under the most restrictive Schedule I, along with heroin and LSD, for drugs that have no accepted medical use. This was supposed to be just temporary, subject to further research to be conducted by the Schaefer Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse created by the Act. Well, the Schaefer Commission found that marijuana was essentially harmless. 
and Nixon went into a panic to manipulate its findings. <coughs> Failing that, he rejected the findings in their entirety, leaving Canada stuck in Schedule 1, where it remains today. And the saddest part of that is the reason. This is a quote from top Nixon aide, John Ehrlichman. You, you want to know what this was really about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or to be black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing, criminalizing them both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. In the Watergate tapes, Nixon blames it all on Jewish psychiatrists out to get him. Uh huh. Amazing. Since then, even the federal government has often acknowledged the actual benefits of cannabis, including by subsidizing cannabis treatment for at least 15 medical patients, filing a 1999 patent extolling the virtues of cannabis as a neuroprotectant, and in 1998, even a DEA administrative law judge found that cannabis constitutes a treatment for several medical conditions and is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known to man. In 1996, largely through the efforts of gay rights activists fighting the AIDS epidemic, California became the first state to legalize medical cannabis. Currently, 29 states and the District of Columbia have legalized cannabis for medical use, and eight states have legalized recreational use, in addition to D.C. All but two states permit CBD. Cannabis legalization is spreading worldwide. 62% of Americans live in states that permit cannabis, but it is still illegal under federal law. The US Justice Department had to eventually react, and under President Obama, it did. In 2013, it issued what we call the Cole Memo, which guided US attorneys not to prosecute unless eight federal law enforcement priorities are implicated. The Cole Memo remains as one of the primary backstops of the entire U.S. cannabis industry. Unfortunately, the DEA has remained hostile to cannabis, only removing, anti only removing inflammatory references to cannabis from its website in 2017. And only in 2017 did the FDA admit for the first time uh, that CBD has beneficial effects. Most state law changes to cannabis laws have been accomplished through voter referendums rather than legislative action. In every state that has legal rec, it has been accomplished at the ballot box. Ultimately, the only solution to the federal law problem is Congress, as scary as that is. Rescheduling cannabis down to Schedule two or lower will not solve the problem because any scheduled drug must be approved by the FDA, and any substance which claims to treat an ailment is a drug. Cannabis with multiple strains and chemical permutations is not one chemical that, that can go through an FDA approval process, even if someone could finance it. If cannabis were rescheduled, the FDA would just go around shutting down all the medical cannabis companies. Congress, the only solution is for Congress to pass a special law and regulatory regime for this special plant, similar to what it did for tobacco and dietary supplements. Until that happens, who would have thought that the savior of the U.S. cannabis industry would be crackpot Republican Congressman Dana Rohrabacher, who has co-sponsored annual riders to federal budget bills prohibiting the DOJ from spending any money to prosecute folks that are in compliance with state medical marijuana laws. Federal courts have relied on that to stop prosecutions in their tracks. The 2000 Farm Bill authorized low THC industrial hemp. As a result, finally, domestically grown hemp is available in the state pilot programs, which about 30 states have, and interstate transportation of that hemp is now permitted. One of the questions I get asked all the time is, is CBD legal? Many companies in the industry claim that it is totally legal. It is not, that is not the case. The DEA totally disagrees. CBD remains a gray area. <coughs> the cannabis industry has grown to over $6.7 billion in 2016 revenues, with over $50 billion projected by 2026, and has provided 150,000 American jobs. Many states have become, become dependent <coughs> on their cannabis revenues. This industry is no longer about joints and bombs. While flour is still king, the fastest growing products are edibles and vapor oils. These products, as well as where permitted flour and pre-rolls, what we used to call loose joints, are available for delivery in many cities within 30 minutes. Can you imagine if we had that back in college? It's no wonder it's the fastest growing industry in America. Industry growth is still inhibited by several factors that have limited scalability, requiring replication of infrastructure on a state-by-state -state basis. 
Many cannabis companies have problems with banking, as you probably mostly heard, especially cultivators and dispensaries, and severe tax burdens under Internal Revenue Code Section 280E crush the net profit margins in the industry. If, as if all these challenges were not enough, prices have now collapsed. Cannabis business owners can no longer get away with loosely managing their business. Fortunately, the impending commencement of legal rec in California is a game changer. That should allow the, that intrastate industry to get so big as to finally achieve some measure of scalability. Meanwhile, Wall Street hasn't seen a growth industry like this since the 1990s internet boom. In fact, probably the most common question I get asked is, which cannabis stock should I buy? There are over 300 cannabis stocks publicly traded in North America, including 36 companies listed on the North American Marijuana Index shown on this slide. Yes, there really is a North American Marijuana Index. However, only two of those companies are listed on the US exchange. The vast majority are traded on the pink sheets, what we, what we used to call the pink sheets, the OTC markets, and only about a dozen of them have annual revenues of about $10 million or more. Their lofty valuations are often based on thinly traded liquid markets, which is a fertile opportunity for pump and dump schemes, which we've also seen, so let the buyer beware. For many of the real companies, valuations are very high, including in the Canadian market. As we've seen, cannabis has a long history. In emerging from its recent American black market doldrums, we have seen exponential growth. We are now at the end of the beginning stage of the rebirth of the US cannabis industry. With increasing legal acceptance, more professional management, and robust investor interest, we can expect to see a rapidly maturing and profitable industry bringing economic growth, good investment opportunities, and most importantly, the enormous health benefits of this plant to the American people at the end of this long and winding road. Thank you, thank you to Neil Kaufman. No, no, quite all right. Good job. Big round of applause for Neil, please. So I am, I'm thrilled to bring up our next speaker, Dr. Yasmin Hurd, class of 82. Uh, of a few things that she's qualified as, she is the Ward Coleman Chair of Translational Neuroscience and Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience, Icon School of Medicine. And if that wasn't enough, she's also the Director of Mount Sinai Behavioral Health System Addiction Institute among the thousand of things she other does. Uh, she does on top of that. Uh, Yasmin is an internationally renowned neuroscientist whose translational research examines the neurobiology of drug abuse and the related psychi uh, psychiatric disorders. And the title of her presentation for this evening is Marijuana from Weed to Medicine, A Scientific Journey. Big round of applause, please. stay close to the mic. It's also weird, the, the journey that we've been all been on. I still can't believe, Eric, that it's been X amount of years since we have, uh, was it, we were in the same floor together in Delaware, and Amy and Mindy is crazy uh, seeing all, you know, well, they're close friends even after all that time. Um, I think that it's really, I like this tier ideas, and I think that it's important to get insights from many different um, fields. And I'm gonna obviously talk about the biology of it, because you're gonna hear all of the other speakers give you the business, and you just heard about the history. And um, you know, as Neil just you know, told you, there's a huge um, socio-political pendulum in our country that we start off with, uh, he went through the whole history of we and where we are today that there's been a decriminalization in many states and the medical marijuana um, and high CBD um, states are popping up more and more. And the question really is, is it really medicinal? Because a lot of the, the legalization of marijuana um, or quote unquote medical marijuana was really based on trying to get recreational use of marijuana. And they're really, it's important to be able to dissociate what is medicinal? And so at the end of this, I hope that's part of our discussion. So the reason why there was a huge problem is that the marijuana plant is very complex. We have over 450 chemicals, um, over 100 of which are cannabinoids. Um, many people know of THC because that's what produces a high. That's why people were smoking it in college and this still uh, today. But there are many others, and so from uh, uh, 
biological perspective, we as scientists and clinicians, we want to know which components of these plants are having the beneficial effects and those components that actually produce the side effects that when we're trying to develop for medicine, we want to eliminate those. So your natural cannabinoids, um, marijuana binds to your natural cannabinoid receptors. We have natural heroin receptors. Every drug that people use, it's impinging on our natural receptors in our, in our brain and body. We have two main types of cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2. CB1 is the one that's predominantly in our brain, and CB2 is mainly in the periphery. The periphery does a lot with immune function, we'll talk about it for people who want to know, but in the brain, which is what I'm most interested in, our natural cannabinoid system is really critical for synaptic plasticity, how cells talk to each other. And it even is important for the developing brain. This is a, a picture showing the, the cells in your brain that express these, pre, expresses these cannabinoid receptors. Basically, it's actually the most abundant G pro, I should say, receptor in our brain the most abundant. So this is one of the challenges also that we have in terms of specificity. So when you're smoking marijuana, it's hitting all of your cortex um, in terms of cognition, um, your hippocampus in terms of memory, your cerebellum down here um, in terms of motor coordination. So one of the things that, oops, Sorry, going back. So one of the things that um, a lot of the states that started legalizing um, marijuana, they started to notice that um, certain things were happening, such as, for example, in the opioid epidemic, which is a huge factor for me, um, we have over 7,000 heroin abusers in our patient population at Mount Sinai. And as you, everyone knows, we're in an epidemic today where nearly 90 people are, are dying every day. They saw that in the states that legalized marijuana, that opioid use was decreasing. And there are many reasons for that. We're still trying to figure it out. But the question is, was marijuana being beneficial? And because of the fact that we are in an epidemic with um, more adults being um, prescribed um, opioids than even the adult population of the US, and the healthcare costs have been off the charts, we have to start thinking differently about can we come up with some novel strategies and indeed could marijuana be one of those um, for us to really look into. So as I said, the marijuana plant is very complex. So is it really the marijuana plant that's really being beneficial for, if it's actually even been, being beneficial for opioid addiction or the other disorders that we see that there's something, it's not good for everything. So we've been looking at THC and also cannabidiol. The first thing is that we, for having anything to be developed to be used in humans, we have to do preclinical studies. So when you look at rats and you let them self-administer heroin, just like humans, they love it. If you give them THC, so this was us giving THC to rats, um, look at adolescents when you were in college and with their friends, and so then they became adults and they definitely self-administer more heroin with THC. So THC we know definitely does sensitize the brain. We can go through any type of, of research. Um, there are some different aspects of doses and so on, but the higher the frequency, the higher concentration of THC, it does sensitize the brain. They like heroin more. We see that even in our, our human kids, our, our young adults. We also know that um, THC induces the psychosis that we do see in people, and especially subgroups of people. However, cannabidiol was decreasing the psychosis. So we asked, could cannabidiol also decrease heroin addiction? We gave it to animals, and the, actually the first day, uh, my uh, junior uh, uh, associate, she said, oh, it, there, it, there was no difference. I said, great, so we know that THC is fine and cannabidiol does nothing, in terms of even exacerbating, because we were like, as I showed you, THC exacerbates heroin self-administration. However, the next couple of days, she said there's something weird in the animals because they stopped self-administering and go trying to seek heroin. So you give them, every time they get heroin, there's a cue line in their environment, and they know when they see that cue line that her to expect heroin. Just like our addicts, it's the environmental, the, the craving cues, the environmental stresses that triggers again the relapse. Just like the humans, the rats, they will start seeking out the heroin, and if they got CBD before, cannabidiol, it actually reduced their heroin-seeking behavior. 
Interestingly, it, the most fascinating thing about cannabidiol is that it lasts a long time, even when it's not in the body, in reducing heroin-seeking behavior in these animals. And that has been something that's very fascinating. I see that there's, unfortunately, some MAC-PC um, conflicts. So what does this mean for the brain? So why is cannabidiol having this effect? When you're a, a drug abuser, there are many neurotransmitter systems that are have gone awry. We know about dopamine, it's important for reward. We know that reward and dopamine are not the key components of addiction. They may start it, so when everybody in the college is taking, the, you know, the, during the weekends, your dopamine plays a role back. As you become dependent, it's aspects of glutamate, glutamate which is your primary transmitter system, um, excitatory transmitter system in the brain, and really leads to um, the importance of your, your prefrontal cortex in terms of cognitive function. We know that when, for example, animals take heroin, just like in our human brains, we study a lot of people, unfortunately, heroin is a large, as a high mortality, so I have, unfortunately, a big brain bank collection, that their, their glutamatergic system in their brain is impaired. What cannabidiol does is normalize that. We see that it also, in heroin abusers, your natural endocannabinoid system is also impaired in the heroin abusers, and again, cannabidiol normalizes that. So this is preclinical animal work. Does it mean, make any relevance for humans? So at Mount Sinai, I tried to, to develop clinical studies to really test this. You can't call something medicinal until you have actual proof that it is. So many people have anecdotal um, data that is not medicine. We will never use that to treat um, the thousands of people that have different disorders. So we've gone through um, and, and we're able to get a company um, to give us the compound of uh, human quality. And we focus on craving. As I said, just like our, our rats, our human patients, the issue is um, the cravings that then triggers the relapse. So if we can find a medication that's not focusing on the reward, we don't really care if the, the drug is producing a reward because that, I said, is not the aspect of addiction. We care if it's inducing cognitive effects and aspects of craving. So we, again, well, it doesn't matter. So we've been given cannabidiol in like a pilot study and in people, we first actually just made sure it was safe we did that first phase one, this is a phase two, small phase two, bring heroin dependent people into the lab, show them videos they crave, we, we make sure nobody leaves their craving, but, and then we study different doses. And one thing we see is that when you show a heroin abuser the cue, just like our rats, they crave more. When you give them CBD, they, it reduces their craving. We see that actually it's probably working because cannabidiol is decreasing their anxiety. And one of the things I, I try to say about our rats, and I don't know if I, I emphasize it enough in terms of the preclinical study, is that cannabidiol's effects were present even when the cannabidiol was no longer in the body. So like weeks later, we would study the animals, show them the cue, it was still effective. The same thing like our rats, the humans, we brought them back to the lab a week or more later, no cannabidiol in their body, they're still reduced craving. We have an idea of why cannabidiol is working like that now. Hopefully we'll, we'll be able to uh, get some work in publishing with that. But clearly cannabidiol is the component of the marijuana plant, at least from a psychiatric um, aspect, both for psychosis and for at least opiate addiction, that we think has the beneficial effects. We see it has very low abuse <coughs> liability. In fact, no one gets reward from taking uh, cannabidiol. We've given it in many different ways, very high doses. Um, we also know that it has no major side effects. We also know that it reduces the opiate withdrawal symptoms. Of, you know, obviously, people going through withdrawal is a, a huge problem. We also, as I said, the, the major thing that for me that's important from a clinical perspective is that it, it's even having a, a beneficial effect when it's not in the body. Um, other uh, drugs have been tested now with cannabidiol, for example, alcohol, and alcohol intake, six weeks later, it's still effective at reducing alcohol um, use uh, disorder. Um, and as I said, in terms of the craving and the anxiety, thank you. So we think that cannabidiol does show the promise 
for, um, crave, for treatments of craving and anxiety, it's not THC. So as I said, there's a promise, but we have to be very careful. It's about if something's only medicinal, it has to be some, we have to know the specific strain, and then therefore the specific components that are really helping us. For example, in different aspects of pain that we're also studying, we know that we need THC at a certain dose. So for our chronic pain patients, that's a very different cannabinoid strain and very different cannabinoid components that we need. Um, the individual differences we also see. Genetics plays a role. We know that um, behavioral traits also impact on the psychopathology associated with cannabinoids and their treatment. And it's really important that when we all talk about you know, the legalization of marijuana, which I think is very important, I was against it to start, our government in the making it very tough for us to even do research makes me have made me change my, our minds because without research you will not have medicinal and medical marijuana. But we can't be naive. The marijuana in the developing brain, especially the marijuana concentrations today on the street, is not the concentrations that were there when we were in, in school. Um, these guys will tell you I didn't smoke. <laughs> so they were like, how did you become an addiction researcher when you didn't take these drugs? Um, but this, the marijuana today that the teens are having is changing the psychiatric pathology that we see. So we can't just be naive about that. So the developing brain is really important. So we have this huge list of everybody says, oh, it's medicinal and it has this great value. All of these, from writer's cramp, these are the things, you know, it's not meant for you to write all of the, the symptoms that it's being touted as the, med, as the, uh, the miracle drug. And for me, it's not. I think that there are components of the marijuana plant that is absolutely uh, medicinal, but it's not a miracle drug. And with that, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Next up, I'm excited to uh, bring to you Deborah Borchardt, uh, a bit of an introduction for Deborah, so you get a feel for, for where she's been. Uh, Deborah is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Green Market Media. She's also the editor of chief of websites Green Market News, Cannabis Craft, and Philly 420. In addition, um, she's covered the cannabis industry from a financial perspective uh, for the past five years, gaining expertise in the business uh, on the Today Show, CNBC, numerous radio programs and podcasts. Uh, prior to that, she's uh, spent 20 years in the financial industry, so uh, I think she knows what she's talking about. So, no further ado, Deborah Borchardt. Thank you. Whereas here in 2014, you saw the recreational use 
And as you see here in 2014 on the medical side, the sales dropped down a little bit. And then in 2015 and, and 16, you see there where the recreational use has skyrocketed. Now here's something that's a little, kind of puts things a little bit in perspective. You'll see there on 2016 that the sales um, for adult use were $850 million, which seems like a lot. In just the last four months in California, with just medical <coughs> use legal, they've done over $800 million in four months. So California is really, really going to shift this market. Um, so when we looked at Colorado and we, and we started to look at what was going on in the medical market once recreational came on, we saw that the card holders fell. And it had peaked at 128000 in 2011. It's currently now at 86,000, which is kind of an interesting thing. And new applications went down. Now, uh, chronic pain uh, accounts for 80 to 85% of all patients. This is always the holy grail when you're legalizing medical marijuana. You want chronic pain. And the reason you want that is, well, we saw that in California, you would go to a doctor on Venice Beach and say, yeah, I got a headache a week. And they'd say, oh, chronic pain. And you would get a prescription. And so that was, and it's not to, um, to try to diminish the people that really do suffer from real chronic pain and that this helps them. But there was definitely a crowd that uh, wanted the legalized marijuana just because they really wanted to get high and that was their way in. So when we look here, this is what gets kind of really more interesting is that argument that, well, they only legalized marijuana, uh, medical marijuana so that people could get high. And everybody went, no, no, that's not it. Well, what the numbers were showing us, though, were that medical sales jumped up at the holiday times, just like recreational. So holiday season, sales always jump. And then the 420 holiday, which is a big holiday, uh, jumped up as, as well. Now, if you've got diabetes and you take insulin, you're not taking more insulin in the holidays, and you're not taking more insulin in April. So it was clear that there were a lot of people on the medical side that were really recreational clients. So that's Colorado. We saw that happening there. So then we were like, well, is this happening elsewhere? So let's look at the other states that uh, did the same thing that legalized adult use. And we see here in Oregon, the same thing as we go further into legalized recreational use, the, the patients drop and the new applications drop. And then over there, you've got Alaska with the uh, cardholder count, same thing those numbers started to fall once you got into legalized adult use. Uh, this just kind of goes into prohibition now um, uh, and, and such, but let's talk about the reasons why we have this decline. So on the one hand, it's a heck of a lot easier to buy marijuana in a dispensary than to go to a doctor and get a prescription. And I'm, I'm just curious, raise your hands if you've been into a dispensary. Okay. So the first time you go into a dispensary, it's kind of mind blowing. There's all these products and there's all this stuff and it's like, oh my God, this is crazy. Uh, it's just a heck of a lot easier to go to a dispensary and buy a CBD product than to make an appointment with a doctor, get a prescription, go get it filled, and, and your insurance isn't gonna cover it anyway. So why are you gonna go through all that effort when you can just as easily go to a dispensary? Um, a lot of uh, times there are lower taxes but that's just not been enough to, to motivate people to just stick with the doctors. Um, and then as I said, there's a lot of recreational parent, uh, patients that were claiming reasons to make legal purchases. Now the big concern here in the industry is, okay, so now we've got this data and it's being proven and we know what, what we're dealing with. What are the negative consequences of the shift that, that really I would say most people in the cannabis industry did not expect to see? So there is a lot of concern that the investment money is just gonna go shift all the way over to recreational. That is where the money is, you know, follow the money. If you are making a medical product, at the end of the day, you're thinking, you know, I wanna hire more people, I wanna expand, I wanna grow, my customers are leaving me, I'm gonna to start to make more uh, adult use products. So it starts to take away from that. We're also a lot, uh, there's a lot of concern that it's gonna take away money from research because again, if all the money is going into the adult use side, there's going to be less of a motivation to do the types of research that the doctor was talking about that we 
really do need, we're just starting to get into some really cool research on things like kids with autism, on old people with dementia and Alzheimer's, that's being done in Israel. You know, there's just so much out there that they want to study and test. And so there's a real concern that if this starts to take away from the medical market, that it's definitely gonna be a problem. Now, uh, of course, the anti-marijuana groups feel very vindicated. They're like, ha, 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 see, we told you that this was a ploy to get there. And to some extent, they may have been a little bit right. Um, I, I ran this video and, and I thought this would be kind of interesting if you guys wanted to see it. And what it does is it traces the, um, it traces, whoops. <laughs> shot this video um, and one of the um, processes that you'll see was uh, cannabis is a vape pen and a lot of people don't have that kind of access that I have to see how this gets made so I thought it would be kind of interesting just to show you the journey from the plant to the end product so you kind of see a little bit of what we're talking about with regards to the medical and, and the recreational we're also seeing that a lot of the dispensaries like I said carry both products and we're also starting to see where a lot of the states are now merging the departments together uh, where now you're having the medical fall into the recreational. So I think with that kind of merging happen, it's going to start to pull away even more from the medical side. So here we go. So how does a cannabis vape pen get made? Well, let's trace the life of an open vape product. It starts with the cannabis plant at the Grove facilities, which is tagged. Then the harvested cannabis is trimmed by workers and the finished product is bagged and once again tagged for that all important inventory. It gets sent to the Organa Labs and big drums. This room can hold a ton of marijuana. It is ready to be processed. Here's a bin showing the inventory tagging that again tracks all of the marijuana that comes to Organa Labs. The company produces in small batches. This particular machine takes three and a half pounds of marijuana. It is then going through a process that removes the cannabinoids and terpenes. They were separated into three different vessels. Here's the terpene being collected. The terpene gives the cannabis its flavor and its smell. We're gonna heat up the oil so it's, it's thin. Uh, we're going to add ethanol to it and we're going to start homogenizing that so we can dissolve all the waxes that are present, all the fats, all the lipids. Um, once we do that at a high temperature, we put that into a freezer and we reduce the temperature dramatically. What that does is precipitate the waxes that were dissolved and uh, then we can filter them and, and remove them. Uh, and then when, what, what comes through is, is ethanol and, and cannabis oil. So, so from there, uh, we do another filtration process to do a little bit of a decolorization. Uh, we remove all the ethanol, and then after we remove the ethanol, we can collect the refined oil uh, over at our other station. So. The cannabis oil is distilled two more times to pull out any remaining impurities. Here on the right, you see chlorophyll still coming out, and on the left is the finished cannabis oil product ready for consumers. The Organa Labs workers built each oil cartridge by hand. This is the 250 milligram entry level cartridge. Organa brand says it is its best seller and they sell over a million units per year. Here's the product on the shelves and it is now ready to be boxed up and sent out to the dispensaries for those retail customers. Organa Brands prides itself on its marketing materials and its professional packaging. It's easy for the customer to see and identify an Organa brand's product. And that, my friends, is how the cannabis goes from the plant to the oil to the consumer. So just to give you an idea, Organa Brands um, did over 100 million in sales last year alone, one company. Um, they do also have a medical product, um, but it's certainly not their big seller. 
Um, so anyway, uh, it's going to be kind of interesting to see where we go with this. As uh, California comes on, we'll start to get some real hard data from them. And uh, we'll, we'll see how the market changes. But it, it's definitely been a very interesting turn of events to see how the adult use market has started to take away from the medical market. Last but not least, Mr. Matthew Green. So uh, Matt, Matt is the managing partner of 420 Group, LLC. In 2015, he recognized the phenomenal growth in consumer-led demand for medical and recreational cannabis, as uh, Deborah has shown is out there. So Matt founded the 420 Group, LLC. It's a boutique investment firm, uh, and they're focused on the ancillary businesses and technologies uh, being developed to support the legal cannabis industry. So, um, you know, uh, Matt's going to speak to the bleeding edge cannabis industry technology. That is his area of expertise, and I'll let it take it from there. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, thank you to, uh, to Binghamton for inviting me and the rest of the gang here to, to, uh, to present our various uh, dimensions of the uh, wonderful world of cannabis. Uh, as Dana mentioned, in uh, 2015, I, uh, I started a boutique investment firm that was to be focused on the ancillary part of the cannabis business, meaning investing in technology specifically that, uh, that don't touch the plant. And I'll get into some of uh, the aspects of what I'm talking about in a minute. So um, I just wanted to give you a bit of background uh, to, to me, sort of professionally, not personally. I am not a Binghamton uh, graduate. I was exposed to marijuana in <laughs> college and maybe even high school. And um, so uh, I, I still sometimes had to test product from some of the companies that I invested. But uh, regardless, um, I was fortunate enough to be introduced to the, uh, uh, to the technology sector in 1987, sort of stop, uh, starting at the top of the heap by working with uh, a guy named Steve Jobs and helping him launch uh, Next Computers. So it was a, a wonderful vantage point. And I think Gary um, was an Amorati Empiris, uh, a client of yours and, and your oh, friends? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we might have met way back in the, uh, in the 80s uh, at our first go around. Uh, so that was a wonderful world, uh, a wonderful uh, introduction to technology for me. It gave me sort of a great perspective, um, and sort of on the wings of Gossamer of Steve, um, I was able to take some of those credentials and leverage it into uh, the nascent internet media and ad tech space. So I just wanted to give a, a few examples of the the kinds of uh, dominant companies in 1998 that were in play. This company, Prodigy, was actually headquartered around the corner from here. Um, I think across the street from the train station. I remember having to, uh, to get out of the train station and walk across the street and go visit them. <coughs> AOL, Yahoo, so these are obviously all media companies, uh, but they, are, of course, uh, were uh, all driven by technology, and uh, two of them s sort of still are. But what's happened since 1998 to present day this is a, a chart and a graph uh, that is, uh, it's got you called a Lumascape, and it identifies different sectors of the internet media tech space, uh, sort of by category. So uh, whether it's a media company or a content company, social media company, et cetera, these are all technology companies. And this particular Lumascape is, is littered with about 10,000 companies. And these are the very leading companies in the technology sector that all service internet and media technology space. But uh, what, I, um, what I recognized about cannabis in 2015, it was exactly at the time and place that the internet media and ad tech space was in 2015 when I first got exposed to it. Um, and uh, this is a, a sort of an equivalent Lumenscape put together by CD Insights, which is a, a well-known financial services uh, research firm. Um, now, it's by no means complete, but these are some of the leading companies um, that some of the attorneys in this group have actually worked with, brands like Ease and, uh, and Leaf, and Leafly is up there, et cetera. But what's gonna happen, obviously, in the cannabis space uh, I'm predicting by, at the very latest, 2021, 
is that there will be over 2,000 really important cannabis uh, technology companies that support the industry. Um, obviously, I have a particular sort of uh, attitude and perspective about technology. It's so important in our daily lives. Uh, we all live and thrive with by Google, by Facebook, et cetera. I've had the good fortune to work with those companies when they were uh, nascent as well. And, um, and so I've been to this rodeo before and I'm gonna do it again in cannabis because it's really exciting and dynamic. And actually the, the end product does good for people either uh, medicinally or recreationally. So, um, so um, Neil and Deborah talked to uh, a little bit about the sort of the business size and scope and scale of what's happening right now. In 2016, the industry itself, just from a pure product perspective, which means really flour, uh, anything that was THC infused, so flour, concentrates, uh, things like uh, edibles, infused vape pens, stuff like that. That industry is worth, uh, in, in 2016, six and a half billion dollars. What I find more intriguing, just from, a, from a, 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 an investor perspective and, a, and growth perspective is, the size of the ancillary marketplace, in other words, companies that support the sale, manufacture, distribution, marketing, lawyering, you name it, that industry is worth $13 million. So combined in 2016, it's a $20 billion marketplace. That's a pretty healthy size for a very new industry. And, uh, and of course, things are growing. So uh, there are, basically three important research firms in, in the cannabis space. Um, and I'm gonna show you a couple of charts, maybe three or four charts, and I'm doing my best to sort of distribute the, the information and the data one by one from those particular companies. This particular chart is from a, a, an app called Frontier Financial. This is their size of estimate marketplace from 2016 to 2025. <coughs> so we talked about in 2016, the uh, core product, THC infused product being worth six and a half billion dollars. And they're projecting a $24 billion marketplace uh, by 2025. I actually just saw from a different research company, the, the data is right now, it's really all fungible. And while everybody expects California to sort of be an important um, um, inflection moment in time for the industry, it will be. But I'm pretty good, sort of all bets are off come California. Um, one research company said, pointed to 2021 and said the, that industry is going to be worth $30 billion. So $6 billion more than what this company is projecting in 2025. So it's going to be that kind of weird data um, for, the, for the next 10 years as more states come online, either medicinally and or um, uh, adult use, Neil would approve that term, rather than recreational. We're trying to, uh, to to use terms that make us seem more legitimate, and in fact, it's probably a good practice. So my point that I, that I made earlier on the slide before this was, so while this industry in 2025 is gonna be $24 billion, um, I'm saying the size of marketplaces is going to be double that because of the ancillary businesses that are needed to support the sale, the manufacture, and distribution of cannabis-related products. So how big is big? Uh, this is a great chart because it talks about uh, the number of cannabis businesses that are in the U.S. And it does a great job at sort of segmenting out who's who and what's what. So from the medical and dispensaries and recreational stores, there's somewhere between 3,400 and 4,700 uh, dispensaries and stores where um, <laughs> if we live in, a, in a, uh, an adult use state, we can call up and order our favorite product or discover new and additional products. Infused product manufacturers, which is, uh, uh, Derry did a good job at highlighting a company called Organa. They're an infused product uh, manufacturer. It's called MI, uh, AMIP, so they have a marijuana infused product license from whatever state that they're in. They're in Colorado. Deborah? Colorado and California. California too, great. Um, wholesale cultivators uh, into the business of so these are farms, whether they're small or super huge. There's a, a lot of really cool companies uh, uh, already in development or rolling out their, their cultivation farms. 
um, and uh, one of them is actually um, really smart. It has, uh, it has somehow gotten the brand name Coachella, and they're building a city in Coachella called Coachella, um, which is all about sort of uh, creating a community where lots of different companies come, can come in and grow and infuse products and make branded products. And it's, it's really an interesting concept. Um, and it requires an enormous amount of money to get it going, but they're getting it going. Um, to testing labs. So testing labs are all important. It's, it's mandated every single company that's in the business of manufacturing products that can get you high have to be tested. Um, and there, you know, there, there are certainly state laws, and there, are, and there are licensed um, uh, testing labs. You have to run your product through those testing labs. They rank, or they, they test the product for potency and for uh, cannabinoids and terpenes and all sorts of other stuff that uh, that comes close to how you think uh, the labeling should look like for your product. And last but not least, there's those uh, wonderful ancillary companies including technology companies and branded product companies. And there's something like 14,000 now to, uh, to 20,000 companies right now. So that's obviously, you know, Deborah talked about or characterized, you know, follow the money or this is where the money is flowing. This is the sector in where the money is flowing. Um, another interesting fact, and this is a chart that I love because when you open up a dispensary, you gotta hire people. Uh, You've got to hire security firms. Everybody gets paid a salary. Everybody buys a house and buys a car and buys food at the local path mark or wherever. And all of those jobs that are being provided that Neil talked about 150,000 jobs right now, everybody's got to eat, drive a car, buy a house. So the economic impact from sales of products through dispensaries and stores and websites or mobile apps like these <coughs> has an additional impact of somewhere between uh, 10 billion uh, to, to 57 billion, depending upon the, the year and the, and the graph there. It's on top of the $50 billion that I talked about earlier. So it's now getting scale. Right now they're scale. So at 420 Group, we tend to focus on, um, on those ancillary companies that actually don't touch the plant. You probably can't see this because I can't see it. Um, but uh, we sort of lumped or grouped and segmented out sort of four major buckets. Science and technology being one of them, media and marketing, which means online and offline uh, websites and apps and you name it. Financial and FinTech, so it's a cash-based business right now and will be for the foreseeable future. So you go to a dispensary, you buy your pre-roll or whatever product, and you pull out your wallet and you pay cash. Credit card's not accepted, thank you very much. So that opens up an entirely new category for uh, entrepreneurs to come in and create an app that allows you to pay by uh, some other, like a PayPal, some other sort of mechanism for, for, for making a cash-based transaction that's not credit card-based nor cash-based. So uh, that's a really interesting category. Then of course there's agricultural and cultivation. So that includes uh, what we call picks and shovels. So, you're an LED light manufacturer and you're servicing um, the uh, indoor grow facilities. You've got the latest in technology. By all means, invent it and sell it. There will be buyers. So what's in the marketplace? What's working? I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at a, at a, at a couple of live examples. This is um, uh, a company called Green Rush. They have, I'm gonna go quickly through this. Right now they have 30, 000, it's an app. They have 30,000, uh, 36,000 uh, users uh, that use their app. It's a discovery app. It allows you as the user to go in and, and, and find and discover products that you think you might be interested in or you know that you're interested in. And now you want to locate it on a local basis and you want to uh, pull out your non-credit card and, 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 uh, and make that purchase. And oh, by the way, get it delivered to your house. So, um, so Green Rush is doing a, a, a wonderful job. Um, they not only serve the consumer, but they also connect that consumer to retailers or dispensaries at a local level in about 150 cities. That's a lot of cities, and uh, so they're really uh, they're really well poised to, to to grow to 300 cities 
and more. <clears throat> As more and more states come online, they'll be there. This is a company that we actually invested in, so uh, full disclosure. Um, this is a terrific uh, ad network, so it, it harked back to my earlier days in the internet and uh, ad media tech space. What's really cool about Adistry is there's a sort of a, a not a, a high level of sophistication amongst uh, products and brand manufacturers, um, or product manufacturers and dispensaries from a marketing perspective. Nor does Google allow cannabis advertising, nor does Facebook and the other legitimate uh, media outlets that you that that with that are top of mind. Um, and so, what Adistry does is allow advertisers and marketers to go into their back end, register for free, and start to discover media opportunities on their very own. And if you were to drill it down on the Adistry site, ultimately what you get to is, um, is there not a, it's not a review page, it's actually, this is what this particular company is offering from a media site perspective. It gives you the demography, the page views on a monthly basis, the, uh, the demographic breakout, gender, location, um, age groups, all that good stuff, a brief description of what the site does and who they're, who they're targeting and who they appeal to. And the really cool thing about Adistry is, as a marketer, you can discover the media sites, social, um, social influencers, put them in your, in your cart, hit the buy button, and you're off to the races. You can actually buy that media inventory and, and then there's a whole different process that takes place where as a marketer, I gotta create my ads, Adistry can help you do that, can help you cycle it. It's a, it's a complicated process, reminds me very much of 1998 again, of the internet space and where we were back then. They're doing it for, for uh, uh, in the cannabis space, it's very definitely needed. Oh, here's another app. This is really, this is a really awesome app. So um, Yasmin talked about sort of the, uh, the, the medical side of the house. Um, and you know, so what, what are the kinds of solutions out there um, that, that, are, that can help me as a pain sufferer of some kind, or I have uh, leprosy, or I suffer from some sort of ailment? Go into Pot Pot, identify the ailment that you're trying to, uh, to discover whether or not there is a cannabis-related solution that can uh, aid in a bed, uh, aid in a bed, and help uh, uh, solve that particular problem. Um, it's also interesting because it aggregates peer-reviewed um, products and uh, and types of strains, etc., to help you further identify and, and drill down into that kind of boy, uh, that that cannabis product that can possibly help you, and then um, and then let you um, actually find a, a local place that sells that particular uh, solution, medical solution, pull the buy button, get it delivered. So uh, that's providing a really interesting uh, service in the category. Uh, Neil mentioned this before. So right now, flour, what we call flour, smokable, represents about 60% of the marketplace, 65% of the marketplace, it's dominant. Right behind that, the fastest growing sector has happened to be something called concentrates, um, which is what Organa makes, that fluidy product that's it's a smokable, it's a combustible product. Um, what's happening right now is something called infused products and edibles especially. So um, when I told my friends, lawyers, doctors, technology, media people that I was getting into the cannabis business, 100% of them said, oh my God, we just did edible by the pool last weekend. We got so messed up, and we had a two-day recovery period. Um, that's fairly accurate, and it happens all the time. Um, one of our advisors worked with a, a guy named Richard Branson. He was exposed to some, a, a new project that we're working on, and he said, I have the same problem. And um, it's usually the bad. Uh, it, it is uh, actually gender-specific. Um, is that because men tend to overindulge across men, the world? And after an hour when they don't feel it, eat another one. Right. And so they overdose. And then they're destroyed. They overdose. <laughs> so I'm um, uh, being candid with you. In two weeks' time, um, we're launching a new product that I founded. It's called Edible Sciences. 
Uh, this is not an appeal for a funding pitch for that, but we're very excited about it and I wanted to tell you what it does. So there's a huge problem, as you, as you just heard, in the edible space, which is dosing. People tend to overdose. The manufacturing process is, is I, would, I would describe it as inaccurate at best. There have been some studies from Johns Hopkins and elsewhere that suggest that 83% of all infused products are mislabeled. So when you buy a, a cannabis infused chocolate bar, <coughs> Colorado, it's, it'll, it, at 100 milligrams, it's segmented into 10 slices. Each slice is supposed to be worth 10 milligrams of THC. It's impossible to produce and bake or make a gummy or a chocolate bar or whatever and have that THC be evenly and accurately distributed throughout that particular product. So what we've done is uh, we're bringing uh, 3D printing technologies to the marketplace. We're launching in two weeks at a, at a well-known uh, conference in Oakland. Uh, 3D printing allows us to literally print accurate edibles all day long, edible to edible, potency to potency, um, product type to product types of gummies and mints and tablets. And, um, and so those are sort of the best sellers right now in, in the edible space. Other dimensions of edibles include people like to drink like sodas that are THC infused. I wouldn't do it, but a lot of people do. Um, so uh, really what this means is um, we're, 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 we're elevating the game um, and we're bringing a new standard and new practice to the production of edibles. And I think it's gonna be very well received. We'll see, starting in two weeks. Anyway, that's all I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Get started. There's, uh, there's some common themes that go through all the questions, and thank you for, uh, for, for taking time to write, write the questions down. So uh, we're going to start with a couple general questions. Um, I'll pass it down and uh, you know, take, take the mic as you see fit. Uh, is there anything that we can learn from the, uh, the international space about uh, you know, legalities that have you know, bypassed this by, by decades or years? Uh, is there anything we can learn from other con countries and, uh, and, and the trends we see there? Anyone there? For, well, Israel definitely leads the, the world. Israel, um, Israel has done the best studies on marijuana, and um, so a number, I think, a few of them working with them. Um, because the government in Israel, they go in hand in hand with researchers, they go in hand in hand with the developers, they go hand in hand with the people growing, and they've really been a very structured way of developing uh, medical marijuana. So um, they're sharing a number of their, um, their uh, all of the experiences that they've had. And the one thing though about Israel, so they've done a lot of great studies, but it's a small country. So they were keeping, so the law in Israel before, I think last year, uh, or a year and a half ago, they could not sell abroad. They realized that, as I said, it's a very small population, so now the, the laws have changed and they're now working more internationally. So we're leveraging all the experience of Israel and trying to collaborate with them, but we have a huge issue with our federal government that's making it challenging to work with, um, with them and other countries. Other yeah, we'll that. Okay, so I represent the exclusive U.S. licensee of Tikkun Olam, which is the leading Israeli medical marijuana company, and that's the the, the company that has you know patient data on 15,000 patients and has been doing all this work for over 10 years. Interestingly, you know in Israel, only medical marijuana is legal. Recreational marijuana is not, um, and they regulate tally. But what happened there is uh, Hebrew University um, actively got involved in the research, and Professor Mitchell, um, you know, he's sort of the father of uh, cannabis research, whereas research in this country has been illegal since 1937 or so, uh, they, they were at least able to do the research and thus have, have that data. You know, we've learned from other countries as well, just look north of the border, Canada uh, you know, has a legal medical marijuana system and uh, is going legal rec in a few months. Uh, and the rapid development of that market, I think has been very helpful for some of the, a lot of the American states in designing uh, their systems, and many American states look to uh, Colorado and the other early adopter states within our country in designing their programs. California does it their own way. Um, it's gonna be a very interesting way. 
um, you know, look, they have a huge market they have to regulate, they have their hands full, um, and they're trying to do it in as coherent and manageable a way as possible, which will be the exact opposite of how they have done it up until now, where it's been just a complete disaster. Um, so I think, you know, we've learned from all around the world and with, you know, state to state in, in, in designing our regulatory schemes and trying to make it work. I would just add on the Canadian uh, situation, they have allowed banking for the companies and so that's made a huge difference. A lot of the stocks there are traded on the Canadian Stock Exchange or the Toronto Stock Exchange and so that's helped tremendously with transparency and it's also helped with the companies as far as raising money and having good books and good systems uh, for transparency. So that's been very helpful uh, lesson we could learn from them. Yeah, actually, the Toronto Stock Exchange will not list the cannabis stock. The Canadian Stock Exchange does. That's where they'll trade. On the venture. They'll do it on the venture. TSX venture. Uh, okay, we'll leave, we'll leave it on. We'll leave it on that. Um, so, general question and, and kind of generally toward, towards Neil and, and Matt, I suppose. Do, do you foresee the differences in federal versus state laws as, as they're varied and wildly different at this point? Create any, any major legal battles in the future, and, and what kind of effect would that have, uh, whether it does or does not? So, uh, you know, the, the federal versus state dif differential? That's a legal question. <laughs> Everybody? Well, um, I mean, there have been legal battles ongoing for decades. Um, as I pointed out earlier, you know, we have seen examples of the federal government seeking to prosecute. Uh, state compliant cannabis companies and having been shut down by the judiciary. Uh, will there be legal battles? Of course there will be legal battles. Um, they, you know, there are legal battles ongoing with the DEA and the FDA. Uh, advocacy groups have you know, filed lawsuits. There was just a lawsuit filed a month or two ago seeking to invalidate the Controlled Substances Act on constitutional grounds. Simply, simply for some of the reasons I explained, that there's just no rational basis we're including cannabis in Schedule One, and that's pretty clear from the history, including the history in this country. Um, you know, there are states like Nebraska that are seeking to shut down a Colorado cannabis industry, uh, claiming that they're harmed. There are neighbors of, uh, of Colorado growers claiming to, uh, you know, who have actually successfully uh, shut down their grower their cultivation neighbors and in a case recently decided. So yeah, there's uh, there's litigation, lawsuits, and legal disputes going on all over the place. Thank you, Neil. Um, kind of an outside the box question for uh, for Yasmin, if you could speak to uh, you know the emergence of fentanyl uh, and other highly addictive opioids. Uh, does that change your research at all in the future? It changes it in the present. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we have more people dying. Uh, because of fentanyl and carfentanil. Um, it's like 5,000 more potent than um, morphine and heroin. So we need, and I keep saying this, um, you know, epidemics calls for a different way of thinking. So you have to think outside the box. And by the time we wait for normal clinical trials through 20 years, a lot of more people will be dead. We have over 60,000 people dying a year in the US more than car accidents and gun violence. So, and fentanyl is just up that. Um, and unfortunately, for whatever reason, I still don't understand the dealers, they're cutting it not only in opioids, so it's not only that fentanyl you find in opiates, we've, they now will put in fentanyl in other drugs. So when people think that they're buying one drug, it's, they all, I mean, different types of drugs, not opioids, it's also have fentanyl. So we do think that cannabidiol, we've just finished a phase two trial that's still blinded. We'll see another phase two trial, we'll see if that replicates and hopefully we can force um, more use of cannabidiol for treating opiate uh, addiction. Yeah, can I just make one comment about that, just to, to amplify that? According to the data from some of the advocacy organizations, uh, based on Colorado or on some of the other states where, where we have some data, one of the real benefits that CBD has brought, it goes to the root of the opioid crisis, which is so many people, you have a back injury, you're in a car accident, whatever it may be, and your doctor prescribes you an opioid 
pain medication and you get addicted to it. And then when your prescription runs out or you, you go to heroin or some other fentanyl, some other less expensive opioid, and what they're finding, at least anecdotally, is many, many of those patients, when their prescriptions run out, instead of going to heroin or fentanyl, they try CBD, it provides the pain relief that they need, and they're able to escape the clutches of that addiction without it spiraling out of control. Well, they're going to um, marijuana in general, not necessarily CBD. Okay, so maybe so the, right, so the THC is still an aspect there, so you know that's why we're doing research to try to figure out which ratio of THC to CBD will help their chronic pain. Um, and so it's not oh, just the CBD. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, kind of Deborah on this one to start if you want to uh, pass that down. So, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was 4th of July weekend. I believe it was Colorado and I believe there was a state of emergency for lack of supply for the holiday weekend of oh, marijuana. Yeah. I think it was. In your house. I think, <laughs> My house. Yeah. I might have been thinking of Vegas. Vegas. Yeah. Excuse Vegas. me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Vegas went uh, adult use legal on July 1st, and then July 4th, of course, is a big holiday, and they had distribution issues. The sales were out of control, way more than they even had any idea would be, and so they definitely had some supply issues. Uh, they have since then uh, seemed to have addressed that. They've got more distributors. Uh, but they do have to start to address uh, their market because they only have a limited amount of people that can grow and provide product. And what they're finding is it's a very tourist heavy area. And so the tourists are buying up whatever they can get while they're there. And so that's been an issue. Uh, there are obviously some big trends in the market as you saw on the chart, 420 is a big holiday. Uh, uh, 4th of July is a big holiday. The holidays are a big holiday. In fact, they now have what, you know, Black Friday, it's now called Green Wednesday. Green Wednesday, sales spike because people are going and buying cannabis to get through the Thanksgiving holiday <laughs> with their family. And this is, it's a big deal now, it's Green Wednesday with people stocking up to deal with dealing with their family every day. So. <laughs> Read or written about any corollary data in terms of the impact on the gaming industry of legalized marijuana? It's, it's yeah. still too new since you've only got July and August, and um, so we really haven't seen that. Okay. There's definitely an issue about where you can consume in Vegas, and that's been the big issue is you cannot smoke in a public place, you cannot smoke in a casino. A lot of the hotels don't have balconies. If you get caught smoking, walking down the sidewalk, you're gonna get in big trouble. So the vapes and the edibles have been huge in that market. They are doing big sales in vapes and edibles because one, you can kind of control a little bit of what you're consuming. And also a lot of people take product back home and usually do not get caught uh, with a vape pen or an edible in your luggage going across the state lines or flying on an airplane. I don't recommend that, uh, but they're not looking for that. And for the most part, by the time you get that product in your luggage, the THC labels are pretty much off and, and it looks like any other candy. So back to in the news also recently is a um, story out of California, a lot of um, collusion with the folks growing illegally in the woods. Do you see any uh, impact on your particular areas of expertise and is there a solution? Well, so what's going to be interesting with California is the black market. So you have a lot of growers that are now going to face the situation of regulatory issues, environmental issues, water issues, which is going to make their grow costs more expensive. And the black market guys are like, well, I can undercut them, I can sell it cheaper most of the black market in California is an export market, so they're sending all their stuff out of state to other states. So the expectation is they're going to start to keep it in state so they can cut down on their distribution costs, but they'll also have a market where it's a whole lot cheaper because they can undercut the guys that are following the rules. They figure that they can get by for about two years doing this, and then they'll ultimately get busted, and at that point they'll sell their property and their, and their, their facility and then probably get hired back as general manager. So. <laughs> 
So that's really what, what we're expecting to see out of California with this change as far as the growers. There's still a huge issue with the dispensaries. They don't have enough license and you have uh, only uh, two or three of the big cities in California that have uh, approved to have legal uh, adult use marijuana for sale. So it's gonna be kind of interesting. Yeah, I attended a conference uh, last November and there was a woman who uh, works for California State and she's really the, the, the governing human that oversees yeah, uh, uh, AMA, which is the Adult Use Marijuana Act. This is the act that's uh, legalizing recreational use. And by the way, recreational use or adult use is 21 plus in every state where uh, adult use is allowed and, uh, and uh, legislated. So, uh, Gloria was up there telling the audience what AMA is, what it represents, and it, we're, we're building in standards and safeguards to the industry. We're making it legitimate. There was a guy sitting in the front row, just two rows in front of me, uh, very well dressed, uh, sort of California, stylish California hippie, and uh, Lori was done. As soon as she was done, he stood up and, and profoundly laced, accused her of destroying his business, his family's livelihood, and was gonna beat her up until the guy that was uh, helpful in running the conference ex-marine ran up to the stage and, and got this guy in a headlock. Um, so while he was vociferous and, and angry, as, as Deborah was, was describing, there's a lot of growers, a lot of growers, cultivators, and black market in California that's not kindly disposed to now paying taxes, keeping records, letting the state uh, government know uh, what it's selling, what, you know, what the revenues look like. So it is not gonna be a seamless sort of transition by any means in California. It's right. gonna be big and not seamless. Oh, it's gonna be really interesting to watch. So I do a lot of work in California, I have a lot of friends in, in California, I have an office in LA. And you know, as we all know, like when we were young, you know, we were lucky if we got some decent marijuana from Mexico, but then California <laughs> cents, a million, cents a million came on the market, and that has really dominated the market for decades. The interesting thing is most of those growers, most of those black market growers, they're just in it for the money. You know, they're not like the proselytizers that we see in the medical marijuana market that they do it for the love of the plant and caregivers. Exactly, and their patients. So they sell they sell cannabis on the black market because they can make a lot of money and they don't have to account to anyone. And, you know, they also generally grow it outdoors. Whereas the medical, uh, medical cannabis is primarily grown indoors, greenhouses. And something like about 85% of the outdoor California crop is contaminated with pesticides. And so contaminated that it's like gotten into the plant DNA. And there's a big question as to whether those growers will ever be able to get their crops compliant with the pesticide requirements that are going to be imposed under the new regulations. And so there's a good chance a lot of those black market players are just going to go away within a couple of years or so because they're just net, they're net, first of all, a lot of them have come into the legal market or at various stages of coming into the legal market. That's a very common trend we've seen. But for those of those of, of those that of, the, of that ilk who just can't get their business complying with the new regulations, what are they going to do? Maybe they'll ship it, ship it to other states, but they're going to get crushed at home. Well, just a few months ago, for the first like time, the back. there was yeah. a report of a crop, a cannabis crop from California, being intercepted at the border, going into Mexico yeah. instead of the other way. I, I was just going to add too that there's been a lot of discussion too about all the wildfires that have been out on the West Coast. If you've seen the new kind of a little bit of the news is all the wildfires they've had and the outdoor grows and the effect of all that smoke on the plant. So there's there is a little bit of concern about that. So last question, we're, uh, we're gonna end with a fun one so we can uh, we can go drink and be merry. You're all very professional, but sometimes you go to parties and what's your favorite party factoid about cannabis? When somebody comes up to you and says, tell me something I don't know about cannabis. What's the first thing to say? 
Well, um, we all know that Yadman doesn't partake. <laughs> but we three, it's our business, and we typically are confronted with sort of uh, premier growers, cultivators, product brand manufacturers. Really potent stuff. So, um, my bad. Oh, go. I cannot do that anymore. No one do that, please. <laughs> no one do it. Very powerful, very potent. You what? What? Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's no, called, it's so called concentrates? Dab. So it's 75% THC. So, so like or the, whatever else you blend into it, but it's so, it's a resin that's so highly concentrated, it's just ridiculous. We won't teach you how to use it. It's okay. It's for the purists and the bros. They, they like the dab. Yes. So, um, my preference is, you know, look, I'm like the rest of you. If I if I need to go get my prescri prescription filled, I go to Dwayne Reed. Uh, and while I'm there, I get Crest and other uh, other branded products that I'm familiar with. Um, so I prefer edibles, you know what, because typically they come packaged up, they look really clinical, and they might as well have been produced by, uh, by Pfizer. So um, yeah, that's right, and with um, Yeah, so. We're, we're conditioned to, to think that way, and, and it, um, um, I, I, I don't smoke, so I don't like combustible products. Uh, so edibles um, is, is my post. If somebody offers me a thing, um, uh, our Ghana product, I'll, I'll take it, I'll move three steps away, pretend like I smoked, and hand it back. I don't want to be on the social. <laughs> so, so I gave away my factoid, which is the fact that this country was built on cannabis. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, this country was built on all the other drugs. All those companies also sold, used to sell cocaine and also used to sell heroin. Um, just backward. Um, people always, even though I don't imbibe, um, <laughs> yeah, he said so excited. No, yeah, exactly. Um, I was a weird kid. I, this guy would tell you I was a weird kid. Um, <laughs> They're all not. It. Um, <laughs> no, when people know what I do at a party, they always tell me about their drug use and want to know which specific one they should use and should use. So that's <laughs> I would say mine is the um, same thing. When I say what I do, of course, I, I get peppered with a million questions. Um, and usually the one I get is, do people give you stuff? And it's like, yes, they do. My desk looks like a dispensary. And it's right. funny, right. when you have it, you, you tend to not do it that much because it's just all over my desk. Uh, but then I guess my little factoid that I like is I like to tell people that the song La Cucaracha is, is based on cannabis. So I think that's kind of funny. Mm -hmm. I'd like to personally thank our panel, our speakers, and if we can give them a few more applause.